if <coughs> and that's where. So you weren't wired back then. No. Yeah. So you can't no. have a conversation over there. No. Oh, Murray'd pull it down anyway. He wouldn't wear it, yeah. even if you were. Murray wouldn't wear one. No. He wouldn't wear one. No. <laughs> Same as Ray O'Connor. Huh? Ray O'Connor in the Athens gold medal game. Him and him and John Wright. Ray had unplugged it. John was asking for help. Here it is in the big screen, plain as day, but John couldn't use the big screen to this, to this day. But yeah, that's, it's always a hard one, but if it continually happens, obviously someone at a, at a higher level needs to deal with that because that's, that's not acceptable. Yeah, especially when they're just overpowering. Well, also makes, because um, if they are making the wrong decision, and you're all trying to play on and uh, that sort of stuff. It makes you look incompetent as an umpire. Yeah. Um, especially if you're not seen to be blowing your whistle all, at all because they are doing it. See, so and you'll, you'll tell if that person is doing that and they're getting it wrong, the teams will be up in arms about it. Mm. And if it is wrong, or it's under your nose, and they're going to you, come on, that's, that's, that's not correct. You've, you've got to deal with it the best you can. And if it's totally wrong and they're that far away, I've got to be careful how I say this because uh, <laughs> they come back and haunt me. <laughs> but you can stop the game and get the captains in and, and say, look, sorry, you know that is not the correct decision. And even if you want to have a bully, you know, let, let's let, just got to remember which hockey we're at. We're at our local hockey, right? Sometimes the best decision for the game is outside the rules of hockey, right? And it comes from here. Sometimes the best decision for the game is outside the rules of hockey. And that's, that's for you to, to work that out, right? Because it, it comes from us being human beings and game knowledge the knowledge of the rules. So, but when, if you want to go down that path, you've got to be very careful. But if you're going to do anything like that, you're always got to have the captains involved in that discussion because you need them on side. You don't want them offside at the same time. So that's, it, it, it's, a, it's a hard one, but just, just tread carefully. Yeah. Come on, you're busting. Come on. <laughs> I'm not busting. Um, fitness. Yep. Can you talk us through what level of fitness you're required to have where you umpire and what you do to get there and do you do anything umpire specific? And if you do, what the hell do you do? Yeah. When, when I was at my peak, yeah. I trained five days a week. I ran the golf course every morning. That's what I did. On the grass, 7.2 k's. Yeah. But what I used to do is I used to do push-ups on the green. I used to do five. Yeah. Five push-ups on the green, sit-ups, uh, sorry, at the tee, when I got to the green push-ups. But I used to vary it. I'd, I'd, I'd do the, the whole distance run push-ups, but then because we have, used to have sprinklers as markers, I used to change it. Sprint, walk, sprint, walk. So I used to vary it. But now, and I think as last year, I don't know if you've seen anything, but they've, they've all been told. Sorry? They've, they've changed the fitness requirements. You've got to send them in regularly. But the thing is, they've all been told, even though you might f be fit enough and pass it, if you don't look the part, you'll not be given the key matches. So you won't be getting semi-finals and finals, it's shown to the world, if you look overweight. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously there's guys that, that, that are fit. Um, uh, uh, most of them are. So, some you can tell that the the results they send in can't be correct, you know. And when when I was umpiring, the older you got, the less you had to do on the beep test, which was ridiculous. Like we're still umpiring at the same level of hockey. So what was the beep test that we had to get? You, if you were under thirty, it was um, ten. Yep. Then from I think thirty-five. Once you got thirty-five, it was nine. And then once you turned forty, you only had to do eight. Yeah, like you can nearly. Is it different for men's and women's? No. Is it the same? Yeah. And I, I, I didn't see any, any of the guys fail ever. 
Um, but I did like the champion, one of the champions trophies. I did. We did a joint one with um, the women, and one of the top female umpires. She didn't make five. Like seriously, I was still walking. She didn't make five. Obviously, obviously she had a health issue, or I don't know. But she could still umpire our game. Well, there was a big commotion. She actually got sent home because the threat was, and then there was huge commotion over her being sent home. But yeah, it really was. But the the thing is, um, I think from the the players' perspective, um, especially when I first started, it was like we were a bunch of drunks and. I took real, real offence to it once in Malaysia, because I was actually down in the bar. Um, I'd been there like five days. I trained with the Australian team like three times a day, and I didn't have one beer the whole whole time I was there. I was in the bar and I was drinking squash, and one of the English guys says, "Oh, you're a typical umpire down on the piss again." I said, "Excuse me," and I tell you, I, I let him have it. I really did. And the next day he came and apologised to me, but. I, I really took offence to it because I was I was training hard at the time, you know, and um, but that was perceptive because what used to happen before some of the stories you heard, holy dooly, you know, it's pretty bad. On average, how many k's would you run in like a top international game? Um, wouldn't have a clue. Okay. You do a fair few though. I know some guys have put their things on. They've ran up to ten k's. Yeah, some do ten. Yeah, until. yeah. Because we did um, a couple of tournaments where we, we actually had to weigh ourselves before we started and then you had to weigh yourself at half time to see if you were taking enough on enough fluid. Because you could lose, like David Leeper from Scotland, he would lose anywhere between four to six kilos in a game if he didn't keep the fluids in. He used to change shirts at half time. He used to sweat profusely. Unbelievable amount of sweat this guy. But he used to play in, in the, the Scottish team. Like he was, he was a representative player, and then he came into umpiring. And for a guy like him, if he didn't keep the fluids up, you know, he'd dehydrate. Yeah. But um, yeah, and it's it's a lot harder now on the the umpires now. They've got to have their results in. You've got to send them in every every few months. Um, they're supposed to be signed off by either Hockey Australia or or someone from the institute. Yeah, and you still see some of them on TV. I doubt whether they really um, send so you're it. Not training as hard now. Me, don't do any. I've got no cartilage left in my right knee, so I had actually when I was doing my last tournament in Melbourne, I had a torn medial meniscus. I didn't realise that. Um, I knew my knee was really sore the last three games, like my very last game, India versus Pakistan, second half oh, was absolutely in agony trying to run to finish that game off. And then I let it rest over Christmas and I wanted to play vets next year. So I was keen to play vets, so I went training first time vets on the Monday night. Perfect, hour and a half, trained, no worries. Went to get out of bed the next morning to go to work and I nearly fell over. Oh, I couldn't walk. Fair dinkum. And I thought, holy dooly, what's going on here? So obviously off to the specialist, torn medial meniscus, whole heap of rubbish. So I went in and got it cleaned out and then he showed me the photo. He said, look, you've got no cartilage left. He said, it's up to you. If you want to keep umpiring, keep smashing it. He said, you're going to be in a lot of pain. You'll have to have a knee replacement. So he said, it's up to you. So I said, ah, easy choice. So I just stopped. And I haven't played for two years, um, but I'm back playing this year just for one season because my son's old enough to play grade hockey this year. So we're actually playing in the same team. And then I'll hang the boots up again, uh, hopefully at the end of the year. So I'm, I'm, I've done uh, one game so far. So you're going to be rusty when you go out there? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be right. Just make it up. It's like falling off horse, just get back on it and carry on. What happened to one game this year? You get a card? Two. <laughs> That's good. Normally I run out of points. <laughs> but um, I, I did um, eight games down home last year, plus um, when I did a oh, seminar in Coffs Harbour, I um, so umpired some games up there for them. Went to Orange and they have a, a super challenge out there, so I went and umpired out there as well and did some coaching. So I've still been umpiring. 
Yeah. Just don't run as much as I used to. Got to be. Do as you say, not as you do. Got to be smart about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm 50 this year, so you got to look after yourself. <laughs> not as young as I used to be. I'm hearing you. Yeah, but it is, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Do you think the technology that you use at the International Lab has changed the way you make decisions? Um, I think... You seem to have it at a pace at a greater pace when you're watching international, obviously. Yeah. Um, the decisions become more critical and, and the technical sort of insight gets sort of available. Does that cause you doubt or anything like that? No, it's actually, it's actually quite good. Some, some umpires, it, it does, it worries them, especially if they get it wrong. Mentally, they struggle to, to get out of that frame of mind. 